Anti-intellectualism is a phenomenon, sociological phenomenon that has been described at least since the 50s. Uh, and again, it's particularly prevalent in the United States, although it's certainly present in other country, in other countries. And it does have a number of different origins in, in the US. And one is the connected to the high degree of fundamentalist religiosity uh, that characterizes this country. Uh, so that's where you get things like you know, creationism and intelligent design theory and so on and so forth. Uh, another one is the fact that American society has a, uh, you know, it's bi- has been built on a pioneer spirit and therefore the only things that matter are practical and, you know, they have to be useful right here, right now. And that implies a disdain for any kind of high intellectual activity, for any kind of things that doesn't have an immediate payoff and so on and so forth. But this this notion that, oh yeah, I can do my own research even though I have absolutely no background in a particular area, that's uh, the sort of naive and dangerous things that um, anti-intellectuals would say. And the problem is that, you know, as we were saying in the beginning, it would be funny if it were for the fact that people die as a result of it. Hello, my geeselings. This is Mother Goose Robinson Earhart here with the introduction to Robinson's podcast number 116. And this episode is with Massimo Pigliucci, who is KD Irani, professor of philosophy at the City University of New York, where he specializes in both ancient philosophy on the one hand and the philosophy of science in the other, because in addition to a doctorate in philosophy, Massimo also has a PhD in evolutionary biology, which is one of the most interesting subjects there is. So in this episode, Massimo and I discuss the vast chasm or this rich landscape between science on the one hand and pseudoscience on the other. And this begins, of course, with Karl Popper's demarcation problem and whether the criterion of falsifiability, so does the discipline make claims that can in principle be falsified by evidence, is this criterion sufficient to distinguish, um, like I said, pseudoscience on the one hand from science on the other. Then we get into a bunch of examples, which is always really fascinating, including SETI, if, which if you don't know, is the search for extraterrestrial life and where that ought to fit in. And then we turn to some broader questions, such as whether scientists should debate pseudoscientists and conspiracy theorists, which is a is quite topical today or this week, or the past couple of weeks. The role of public intellectuals in all of this, and and then how scientists should communicate with the public in the first place. So there's a link in the description to Nonsense on Stilts, which is Massimo's really terrific book on these topics. And there's also a link to his website where you can find information on all of the other projects he's engaged in. So there is now a Discord, which you can find through robinsonearhart.com for the podcast. Comments, reviews, likes, etc., are endlessly appreciated. I have this other channel on Twitch and YouTube called Robinson Eats, in which I typically have ice cream every day if you want to sit and talk with me. Then there's this, the newest, boldest fashion empire there is, Robinson's Fashion Empire, which you can also find through robinsonearhart.com. So without any further ado, I hope that you enjoy this conversation as much as I enjoyed having it with Massimo. Before we get into pseudoscience proper, I'd really love to talk a bit about why you find it such a fascinating topic. And I gather that there's at least two components here, or I'm assuming, in that there's a moral dimension. I mean, you feel a sort of duty to promote bona fide science, especially when pseudoscience can be dangerous. And then I imagine that there's also a sense in which you find the attraction to pseudoscience fascinating on a psychological level. Does this sound right to you? 
Yeah, I mean, I don't need to answer the, the question further. I think you got it. Um, but let me elaborate a little bit over it. So first of all, when I was a kid, actually, when I was in junior high school and early high school, I was myself attracted to pseudoscience. So I, I know, yeah, so I've experienced the pool of the mysterious and like, oh, cool, let's read about UFOs and paranormal phenomena and stuff like that. Um, so, so I actually understand uh, why people find it attractive. However, yes, as you say, <clears throat> in the first place, I do think that uh, searching for the truth to the best of our uh, abilities is, in fact, an ethical duty. It's 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 a moral it's a moral issue for me, and not just for me. There's plenty plenty of people have have written about this before. In fact, it goes all the way back to uh, the ancient Greco Romans. The the Stoics thought, for instance, that uh, knowledge is a virtue. It's and so it needs to be cultivated as as such. It's something that makes you better, even in, the, even in fact independently of any practical consequence, just knowing the truth or searching for the truth, regardless of whether it's going to be useful or, or not, uh, is a value in, in and of itself. And then, of course, there is the additional thing that untruths are often dangerous, right? Um, when I wrote a book on pseudoscience uh, a number of years ago, uh, Nonsense on Stilts, I was often asked, you know, well, why bother? You know, why, why don't you let people uh, who want to open up the horoscope in the morning, you know, have their fun? It's like, what what is the problem? Well, first of all, they, of course, they have the right to do whatever they want, but I have also the right to criticize them for, for what it is that they're doing or not doing. But the thing is, a lot of pseudoscience is, in fact, positively dangerous. It's not just reading the horoscope in the morning and having a laugh about it. That's not a problem. Uh, what becomes a problem is if you don't vaccinate your kids because you don't think the vaccines are a good idea. Or what is a problem is if you get HIV and you don't believe, you know, uh, HIV AIDS and you don't believe that there is a connection between the virus and the disease, and therefore you're not going to take the medication and eventually die. So, you know, those kind of things are, are problematic. Not to mention, of course, the now always present big elephant in the room, which is science denialism. Um, sorry, climate denialism. So, you know, we're talking literally about planetary consequences in this case. It's not just, oh, well, the person who doesn't believe in science is going to suffer its own, their own consequences. That's sad in it enough. But when the consequences become society-wise or even planetary-wide, then, then it's a real big deal. Mm -hmm. And speaking of climate denialism i was uh, and i guess speaking about this moral dimension i was astonished to see that conspiratorial thinking about climate change has brought about literal uh, witch hunts and executions uh, which i actually saw in nonsense on stilts which parenthetically i mean is great i know you said you wrote it a few years ago but it totally holds up and what's a rarity for philosophical books is that I think due to the wealth of examples of pseudoscience and conspiracy theories, it is also extremely uh, entertaining. <laughs> yes. That, well, that's, that's the thing. It is entertaining. And if you, if you take, you know, the whole business is, is, is actually entertaining as well because even if you don't have an in-depth knowledge of science, critical thinking, et cetera, et cetera, sometimes it's really hard to believe that some people believe what they believe. It's like you want to say you want to shake them and say, "Really? That's that's uh, that's the way you think about the world." But they do, and so if you want to look at it at the funny side of things, uh, yeah, it's it's actually pretty funny. But it is a kind of um, comedy that has unfortunately nefarious consequences, and that's why it's a, it's a serious matter. Mm -hmm. uh, before we move on though to some of the more substantive questions, I am curious. You said that you were hooked. Maybe you didn't use the word hooked on pseudoscience in high school, but what were the the topics that you were interested in? Was it UFOs? Yeah, mostly it was UFOs and to a lesser extent, paranormal phenomena such as telepathy, uh, mostly telepathy, chiefly telepathy. I was never into ghosts or haunted houses or, you know, anything like that. Who knows why? I mean, you know, this, this it's um, none of those things actually has... Um, particularly good empirical evidence to back them up. But uh, it is a well-known thing that some people uh, accept certain pseudoscientific beliefs and reject others. 
Uh, most obviously, for instance, if you're a religious person, you tend not to believe in things like witches and ghosts and stuff like that. Uh, and that's presumably because it's antithetical to your worldview and therefore they don't fit very well. But you're fine with things like telepathy or clairvoyance or stuff like that. Hmm. Well, hopefully we get to the parapsychology and the UFOs. I just had Avi Loeb on the show and we had a very interesting discussion about Umumua and his uh, beliefs about it. But first, uh, as you begin Nonsense on Stilts, a discussion of pseudoscience probably ought to start with Popper's demarcation problem. And so let me ask, what at first blush distinguishes science from everything else and then more particularly from pseudoscience? Though, of course, we'll, we'll find some more nuances here. Yeah, well, that's a great question, and it's not an easy one. Uh, yeah, you're right. Any discussion like that probably uh, should start with Popper, although that question has been around for quite a while. As far as I know, it was Socrates, of all people, who raised the issue of what we call the demarcation problem, the distinction between science and pseudoscience. Uh, well, actually, what Popper called the demarcation problem. Uh, in a platonic dialogue uh, entitled The Carmides, Socrates uh, at some point asks, you know, what is the difference between a quack and a doctor? And how do we tell? And at the end, he says, you know, the only, the only way to tell is if you're actually yourself a doctor. In other words, if you're an expert, uh, then, then you're going to be able to tell. But the rest of us is gonna, are going are gonna to have a hard time uh, because quacks sound very much like doctors. And um, so, so that question has been around for a while. Popper was the first one in modern times to sort of make it the centerpiece of research in, in what we call philosophy of science these days. And he thought he had arrived at a very neat solution. He thought that uh, if a theory or a statement can be falsified, it is scientific. If it cannot be falsified, it's non-scientific and more likely than not pseudoscience. What does that mean? So falsification is the at least theoretical possibility that if you claim something, that there, there has to be a way to verify, to, to, to say, okay, is this actually not true? And to confirm that, in fact, it's not true. So the falsification, falsifiability means that there, is a possi there has to be a possibility to show that a statement is false if it is, in fact, false. So, for instance, um, if I were to say, you know, right now I'm wearing a blue shirt, that statement is falsifiable, and in fact, it is false. The color of my shirt is not blue, and you can see that um, through through the through the screen. So, so that's a uh, not a pseudoscientific statement. But if I were to say that I'm wearing an invisible shirt that cannot be touched, cannot be analyzed chemically, doesn't reflect life, doesn't weigh anything, and so on and so forth, now that statement is unfalsifiable. Right? There's no way that you could possibly prove that that statement is, is false. Notice also that Popper put the emphasis on falsifiability, not verifiability. That is, he didn't think that to verify a statement, to, to uh, come up with empirical evidence in favor of a statement was particularly important because it's too easy to come up with uh, reasons to believe in things or to for evidence that apparently it, it, it's it's sustaining or, or at least not contradicting a particular notion. It's only when you get to the point of uh, being able to show that something is in fact false that you made progress. One way to understand this is that, it, that Popper thought that science makes progress not by confirming theories, not by you know, uh, accepting the theories as true, but by eliminating theories that don't work. So we don't know, for instance, whether general relativity is true. We just know that it works well enough. It has there is a lot of empirical, uh, you know, verification of it. But we don't know if, whether it's true or not. What we do know is that Newtonian mechanics is false, and that's because we have empirical evidence showing that uh, some things that the theory predicts are actually not, uh, you know, not the case, and therefore the theory must be false. So that was. Gr that was great. In theory, like he had, he had solved the problems. Like not only he had given a very good definition of science, 
but it also, by implication, uh, defined, come up with a definition of pseudoscience. The problem is that it doesn't work. Uh, that is, the, the criterion of falsifiability is actually not very um, apt to solve the problem of demarcation. Why? Well, for instance, there are several pseudoscientific statements or, or constructions or theories that are, in fact, falsifiable. Uh, let's say, let's take um, flood geology, which is a type of creationist uh, you know, statement about the, the age of the earth. So according to flood geology, all of the major geological formations in the world, including the Grand Canyon, were uh, created, at, you know, were formed at once uh, very suddenly and very recently, 6,000 years ago. By, of course, a worldwide flood. Well, anybody who knows anything about geology will tell you that that statement is in fact false. It doesn't doesn't go with anything else that we know. <coughs> excuse me about either physics or or geology. So that statement sounds like a scientific statement, but in fact, it's false. So it is pseudoscience, but it is falsifiable, and in fact, we know it to be false. So Popper was incorrect that everything that is not falsifiable is in fact not science. And it gets worse. There are some scientific theories that are non-falsifiable at least for certain long for, for certain long periods of time, and yet nobody thinks that they're pseudoscience. For instance, string theory in physics, right? So string theory is supposed to be or has been promoted for the last several decades as the next big thing in fundamental physics, it's supposed to unify quantum mechanics and general relativity, uh, but it's unfalsifiable. There is, it makes no. I mean, all the novel predictions that it makes are actually not empirically testable. The only ones that are empirically testable are predictions that we already know about, and that are made also by either quantum mechanics or general relativity. So at the moment, uh, string theory is unfalsifiable, but nobody in his right mind thinks of it as pseudoscience. And so there goes the, the Popperian uh, approach. It doesn't, it doesn't work. What modern you know, contemporary philosophers of science seem to agree on is that there is no simple definition. There's no simple demarcation line between science and pseudoscience. It's a complex landscape. And it's a landscape that is defined by uh, how complex and sophisticated a theory is, how well the theory matches the empirical evidence that um, is available and a number of other criteria. So there is not a simple, small number of criteria that would separate science from pseudoscience. Some cases are obvious. Fundamental physics is a science and creationism is a pseudoscience. Those are pretty clear. Others, uh, perhaps more interestingly, are kind of borderline. Uh, so for instance, is the search for extraterrestrial intelligence science or pseudoscience? Well, that's a good question. I mean, it is done usually by scientists using things, you know, scientific instruments like radio telescopes. And yet it has been going on for 70 years with not a single data point in, in its favor. There's, we don't have any data at all about uh, intelligence, uh, you know, other intelligent civilizations in the, in the galaxy. So I could say, well, that's a funny science. It's a science with no data. Or maybe it's not a science after all. Uh, or you could, I uh, mentioned earlier, things like telepathy. Telepathy for a long time was on the borderlines because for over a century, people had done research in university departments at Duke, for instance, at Princeton, on the possibility of telepathy. And for a long time, the thing was kind of borderline. I mean, it, it seemed like there was some kind of evidence for it, but it wasn't that compelling. At this point, I think, we're done. Um, I, my judgment is that no, telepathy is just not a thing and there is no, it, that, that uh, conclusion isn't likely to change. Uh, but it is certainly far closer, the field is far closer to actual science than, let's say, creationism or astrology or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Well, returning for a moment to the, the first thing you said, uh, Socrates' question, what is the difference between a quack and a doctor, is still uh, very topical and pressing today. Maybe we'll get to the difficulty of selecting experts. But 
a further dimension of this unfalsibility is unfalsifiability. I found it quite fascinating that Marxism and psychoanalysis, uh, two theories that you mentioned in Nonsense on Stilts and that I think Popper also referred to, are precluded from being science because they are simply too powerful in that they can accommodate any new evidence and just sort of, they're they're hydratic in a sense maybe in a similar way to string theory i've heard this before is that if string theory just has many different heads if if there's a dead end a, a new one will spring up and accommodate the new that's right um, yeah that was an interesting insight that popper had that his point there was if a theory explains everything, then it doesn't really explain anything. If every po- conceivable data uh, that can be drawn uh, at the theory can somehow be accommodated, uh, then the theory is, is, is only superficially done explaining uh, things, but, but in fact it's not. And that goes certainly for Marxist theories of history. There is, you know, they, they seem to be capable historically ever since they've been proposed to accommodate anything, no matter how superficially, apparently contradictory to the theory. And the same, probably even worse, actually goes for Freudian psychoanalysis. String theory is an interesting one because, of course, the string theories would reject that uh, that characterization. But in fact, string theory is not a, a, a single theory. It is a large landscape of theories. Uh, you can change the basic parameters of the theory and you get a lot of other very closely related theories. And the last time I checked, the number of string theories out there is astronomical. It's like, you know, into the millions. And so if that's the case, then of course string theory can accommodate anything because all you need to do is to shift the parameters, tweak the parameters a little bit, and you'll be able to account for any kind of new evidence. If that's the case, and I am not positive because I'm not a fundamental physicist, so we would have to ask a physicist about this. But if that is the case, then yeah, that's a strong case for discarding uh, string theory. If not as pseudoscience, certainly not as good science. Hmm. I'm I'm just curious personally. So granted that for the moment, Marxism and psychoanalysis qualify as pseudoscience on your reading. Do you personally find any value to them as theories? Any interest whatsoever? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I find value in what Marx and Freud wrote, which is not quite the same as finding value in the theories as they've been developed and then later by Marxists and Freudians, right? <coughs> Excuse me. So you find them more interesting in a sort of historical context, maybe the development of economics or the development of psychology, but less in the sense that they're, they should be of any practical use to us now, or they should serve as any sort of guide for us when we think about how history, economics, or the mind actually function. Right. Correct. So Freud's great insight was that a lot of what's going on in, in human behavior is the result of subconscious processing of information, subconscious thinking, so things of which we're not aware. Uh, and that is still true. Uh, that's still, that's in fact empirically true. What is not empirically true is a bunch of the specifics that he came up with, you know, uh, the, the various syndromes that he described, uh, the, the actual structure of, the, of this subconscious and so on and so forth. Similarly with Marx, it is certainly the case that economics is important as an historical force. What is not the case is that it is the only or pervasive force that, that everything can be reduced to, to economic or economics or to the struggle between classes. What is not true is that communism is the obvious end of, of history and that sort of stuff. Those, those things are, are out of the question uh, as far as we can tell. But the fundamental insights, on the one hand, that economics is very important historically speaking, and on the other hand, that subconscious is very important psychologically speaking. Yeah, those are those are there. Those are important. Okay. Well, then, returning to the first of those two topics that I I wanted to get to, which were SETI and parapsychology. So you you've already mentioned that you classify SETI as 
quasi science and i i'm hoping that you could put some more color on just why the search for extraterrestrial life gets classified between science and pseudoscience is it just because it is sort of open ended and there is it's i guess it's it's unfalsifiable in a sense Right. So first of all, it is unfalsifiable. Uh, you know, if the statement is there are intelligent civilizations out there, that statement cannot ever be proven false because the universe is essentially infinite and you would have to search every single nook and cranny in order to falsify that statement. But as I said a few minutes ago, falsifiability by itself, although it's a good guy, it's still a good guidance. It's still a good uh, idea to keep in mind because if something is unfalsifiable in principle, then it's, it is problematic. But in and of itself is not sufficient to classify something as a pseudoscience. And as I want to be clear, I do not think that SETI is pseudoscience. I do think, however, it is borderline science. And the reasons I think that is, first of all, because it doesn't really have a lot of a theory behind it. It's kind of an open, as you pointed, it's an open-ended search. Like people point, point radio telescopes out there and then hope for the best. That's not really a particularly, you know, sophisticated way of doing science, uh, so, so to speak. I mean, the SETI supporters will claim that there is a theory, but if you look at, the, at what this theory allegedly consists of, you don't really find a lot of meat. The major theoretical uh, bit of the SETI program has always been the so-called Drake Equation. Now, first of all, that's bad news right there because the Drake equation was produced was proposed by Frank Drake back in the 50s. And we're now in the 2020s. If 70 years later you still think that the major theoretical structure is what it was at the time and nothing really much has happened in, in between, that means that as a research program, SETI has not really moved that, that, that far from its beginning. That's not, a, not good news. The other thing is uh, the great the Drake equation is a essentially a list of parameters that influence the probability of discovering or of of probability of existence of a technological civilization. Now, some of these parameters have been measured or can be estimated, like the number of stars in the galaxy. That's that's a relatively easy one. When Drake wrote down the equation, one of the parameters was the number of systems in the galaxy, stellar systems in the galaxy, that have planets. Now, at the time, we only knew of the solar system, or our own solar system. So, who, kn who nobody knew what what that number, that particular number, might look like. But now we have quite a bit of information about extrasolar. Uh, systems and planets, so we can actually come up with a reasonable estimate, at least in in our galactic neighborhood of, of for that number. So, um, things have improved. <clears throat> However, there are other uh, factors or, or variables in the Drake equation that I have no idea how anybody can possibly think of estimating them. One of them is the likelihood of uh, that, that once life has, has arisen on a planet, that that life would eventually develop into intelligence. We have no idea how to how to estimate that number. We know of one case, our own, but that doesn't tell us anything about pro you know estimating probabilities in, in the case of n equal one. It's it's not a it's not a good way to go. The likelihood of life originating on a planet is also an entirely unknown, as far as we can tell. Again, we know of one case, our own. Now we may discover relatively soon other cases. So if we do find life on Mars, even fossil life, or if we find a life on one of the moons of Jupiter, then we will have more than one case. But at the moment, we don't. And uh, even if we did, we only have a handful of cases. Now, a handful is certainly more than the, you know, better than one, but not much. And then there is other things like the duration of a technological civilization. Well, we don't have even a single case for that because our civilization, thankfully, is still going. We don't we don't know how long it might last. It might end, you know, in a few decades, or it might end in millennia. We have no idea. 
or millions of years. We have absolutely no idea. So there are certain numbers in Drake equation that are pretty much impossible to estimate. That's bad news, considering that that is the fundamental aspect, you know, theoretical aspect. But there are more subtle problems with SETI. The entire enterprise is implicitly uh, based on the notion that we can universalize, generalize human psychology. I mean, after all, why would other civilizations want to communicate with us? That's because we want to communicate with them. So we assume that they would want to communicate with us, but there's no foundation for that assumption. It's just a projection of human psychology. Um, what kind of guarantees do we have that anybody is going to else other than human beings is actually interested in developing technologies in the first place? I mean, we don't know. We, we take these things for granted simply because we have done it. But there is no particular reason other than projecting uh, human psychology and human history onto aliens uh, to think that that has actually happened anywhere else in the galaxy. It may or may not. I'm not suggesting that it didn't. I'm just saying that the only reason we think so is because we universalize uh, human psychology. So in other words, the SETI project is, in a sense, a big uh, example of a, of a gigantic human ego. You know, we, we project the way we think across the galaxy, and we say, okay, good, and let's, let's find out what, what these people are doing. I mean, even when um, SETI researchers try to figure out, okay, how do we communicate we're, they're always going on the basis of assumptions about human psychology. Oh, surely they'll use mathematics, let's say. Surely? Why, why would that be the case? Mathematics is human invention. It's not, you know, I don't, I don't believe that mathematics is universal anything. It's a language. It's a human technical language, just like logic. So um, some other, other civilizations may or may not and hit on the same way of doing things or may or may not think in the same way. We have absolutely no idea. So all of those are serious problems. And of course, the biggest one of them all is that we have no data, no positive data. We have a lot of negative data, but we have no positive data. Now, of course, this conversation we just had could be rendered completely null and void if, if the two of us wake up tomorrow morning and read in the New York Times that Sadie has discovered, you know, uh, intelligent signals from space, in which case I'll be the first one to open the champagne. I mean, I'm, I'll be very happy if that kind of thing happens. But if we're talking about the status of Sadie as a science, those are all significant problems. That said, I wouldn't classify Sadie as a pseudoscience. Uh, I would classify it as a pretty sloppily fought out and 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 not particularly successful quasi scientific approach but but it's not not anything like astrology or creation is more anything like that uh state the researchers are not violating the laws of nature uh or anything else that we know from science and when they point their radio telescopes somewhere do you think that we should not be investing resources in something like SETI because it seems to me like even if it's not a rigorous science, it's still a very worthwhile endeavor. That is another very good question. I don't know. When if you asked me that question, you know, 20 years ago, I would have said, of course you wish to spend the money. Um now I'm not so sure. Um uh, SETI doesn't cost a lot, uh broadly speaking. I mean we're talking about tens to hundreds of millions of dollars a year, which is sounds like a lot to maybe you and me, but it's not in the general scheme of things. So maybe you can make that argument. You know, look, it doesn't cost much, uh, but at the same time, there you know, scientific funding is is or funding in general of any kind of human activity is a zero sum game. Uh, unfortunately, you know, we have limited resources. So even if it's not a lot of money, uh, you could still make an argument that maybe a hundred million dollars a year should be spent, you know, helping the poor instead of uh, in engaging in these kind of things, especially given that we don't really have any idea whatsoever how successful or how likely to be successful this endeavor is. I mean, there are other scientific projects that are far more expensive than uh, SETI, and usually they're justified on the basis of the payoff and the likelihood of that payoff. I mean, I was uh, for years on, on panels, grant panels at the National Science Foundation, and boy, that was always one of the questions asked – 
by the panelists to anybody who wanted money. You know, how likely is it that you're going to succeed on this? It's kind of interesting to me that people don't ask that question for SETI. Um, you know, so. To take one more concrete example. So I, I already mentioned Avi Loeb. I spoke with him recently and he's up to recapitulate for those who aren't aware of him. He's a an astrophysicist at Harvard. And I think it was in 2017, this comet Oumuamua came into the solar system and all of the observations made about this comet were scientifically motivated and, and they noticed many strange things about it. I think it's, its orbit was off. Uh, it had a strange shape a strange sort of rotation. And all of these things struck Avi as so improbable that he theorizes it to be its origin to be of extraterrestrial life. I think one hypothesis he has is that it's a fragment of some structure called a Dyson sphere, which is a, a sphere for harnessing the energy from a star or it can also be uh, a fragment of some sort of spacecraft and without putting words into your mouth is my understanding of your position is that while i mean all of the tools so to speak of science make these observations possible and obvious an accomplished astrophysicist these observations don't license the sort of theories that he has about them and they shouldn't be called science because this object Oumuamua is now so far gone we can never observe it again capture it test it and the theory is just unfalsifiable in that sense right i think that we're talking about something that again it's borderline science and i don't think that we should be spending too much time on it um because as you say the object is gone it's not going to come back and there is no way to verify or falsify anything that has been said about that i mean dyson spheres are entirely hypothetical we don't know of any of, of these of those things to begin with so now you're trying to explain a mystery by way of an en enigma and it's like really um, this is not this is not a, normally a good way to proceed in in science. Also, my understanding by uh, looking at the literature on that specific topic is that um, he's in a minority. You know, he's he's one of the very few who actually um, takes seriously this this kind of possibility. Now, of course, just because somebody's in a minority, that doesn't mean they're wrong. But the history of science is is full of people who were in a minoritarian position and it turned out to be to be right but it's also full about a lot more examples where minoritarian positions turned out to be in fact uh, not not a thing it turned out to be unsustainable and you know we were talking about expertise earlier and here's the thing so neither one of us um I, well i don't want to presume in your case but certainly i am not an astrophysicist so i you know why am i qualified to talk about this stuff in the first place i mean my area of interest is pseudoscience in general, uh, but I'm certainly not specifically qualified. You know, if you were to ask me, well, would you want to get into a debate about uh, the specifics of of the of the of the theory? I would say no. You need another astrophysicist. I can't do it. However, when I looked at the literature, it turns out that the consensus opinion, the majority of experts, thinks that that's that was simply a comet. You know, an unusual comet, but a comet nevertheless, not an extraterrestrial object of uh, intelligent origin. That is one of a number of criteria that people who are not experts can and should use when it comes to these kinds of issues. You know, look at uh, in the, the following. First of all, is the person who is making the claim himself an expert? In this case, the answer is yes. You know, this is a legitimate scientist from. Harvard. If it were not, then I would take that possibility even less seriously than I already do it. But then the next question is, well, what do other scientists think about this thing? What is the consensus? And it turns out the consensus is definitely against the theory in this particular case. Again, that doesn't guarantee that the consensus is right, but you know, if you have to bet your money 
you're going to abandon the consensus on the scientific consensus, not on on the exceptional voice. This is, by the way, something that we actually do in normal life. Let's say, you know, I, before we studied, I told you I probably have a little bit of a bronchitis, so I have, you know, sore throat and coughing and stuff like that. Well, when I studied him and the symptoms, what did I do? Did I go to my mechanic? No. Did I go to, uh, you know, a journalist? No. Did I go to uh, a doctor? Yes. <laughs> right? Why? Well, because that's the relevant expert, right? Uh, I know from, 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 experience and from what the way in which our society is structured that if you have a health problem you go to a doctor now if i wanted to know whether that doctor was is reliable or not then i have a number of tools at my disposal first of all what's the track record of that doctor does he get things right more often than not um i can ask i can start asking around asking asking other patients for instance you know or my own history is that person has that person helped me in the past? You know, has it has it is his suggestions had that they worked out or not? And then if I have still doubt, I'm gonna look for a second opinion or a third opinion or a fourth opinion. In other words, I'm gonna look for consensus among experts. All of those things we do on a regular basis. And it's funny to me that people don't do that often when it comes to science. Uh, they go for the lone person or the conspiracy theory or oh all of these people you know they're scientists what do they know but in any very other area of uh regular life you know if you i mentioned a mechanic if you if your car doesn't work what do you do you go to the expert and and how do you evaluate whether the expert is a good one or not well you look at their credentials you know that's why both mechanics and doctors have diplomas on their in their offices when you walk in right because those are the credentials that they show that somebody has checked on these people and yeah they they are who they claim to be uh you look at their track record you look at what other people in the same general area of expertise do so it's kind of very weird if you think about it that a lot of people don't do that when it comes to science you know during the pandemic there were lots of people who say oh i'm doing my own research really on what grounds that would be like me having a problem with with my car and say oh i'm gonna fix it on what on what basis what am i going to do look up a bunch of youtube videos on how to fix cars i don't think so it's not it's just not going to work and the car is also going to be a lot simpler than understanding vaccine science absolutely <laughs> absolutely i know i have a i had a relative actually who during the pandemic uh, asked me to send her the uh several of the papers from the from the uh, primary literature that we're talking about the vaccines and and the, the COVID virus and so on and so forth. And I asked, I said, you know, why why do you need them? I said, I can send them to you, but why why do you need them? Oh well, you know, I want to read, look for myself. And I said, but you you're not a virologist, you're not an epidemiologist. How what are you going to do? And her response was, well, I took one course in statistics in college. Oh, okay. If that's all it takes to be an expert on vaccines, then go ahead and knock yourself out. But you're not going to, I guarantee you, you're probably not going to understand what you're reading. Or even worse, you're going to misunderstand what you're reading, in which case uh, you're going to act on, on the basis of you know bad information. Mm -hmm. uh, quite recently, I think Sam Harris had a, a tweet or something something like a tweet where he was deriding this new, I don't know, religion or motto of the pandemic era, which is like, quote unquote, do your own research, because so few of us are qualified to do the research on these topics. And what I find very funny is if you suggested to somebody that they should do their own research on some esoteric branch of math, like motivic cohomology, people would say, no way, no way. I am not capable of that. I can barely do um, high school algebra. But as soon as it turns to vaccines and COVID, people do really feel like they're capable of judging and understanding the science. And so it's very strange why that is. It's in a sense, it's a one more manifestation, uh, especially in the United States, of anti-intellectualism. 
Anti-intellectualism is a phenomenon, a sociological phenomenon that has been described at least since the 50s. Uh, and again, it's particularly prevalent in the United States, although it's certainly present in other country, in other countries. And it does have a number of different origins in, in the U.S. And one is the connected to the high degree of fundamentalist religiosity uh, that characterizes this country. Uh, so that's where you get things like you know, creationism and intelligent design theory and so on and so forth. Uh, another one is the fact that American society has a, uh, you know, it's bi- has been built on a pioneer spirit and therefore the only things that matter are practical and, you know, they have to be useful right here, right now. And that implies a disdain for any kind of high intellectual activity, for any kind of things that doesn't have an immediate payoff and so on and so forth. But this this notion that, oh yeah, I can do my own research even though I have absolutely no background in a particular area, that's uh, the sort of naive and dangerous things that um, anti-intellectuals would say. And the problem is that, you know, as we were saying in the beginning, it would be funny if it were for the fact that people die as a result of it. Um, mm-hmm. Do you think it's important for intellectuals, scientists in this case, to debate conspiracy theorists or pseudoscientists in public fora? Because I have the sense that I was just talking about one of talking to this, talking about this with one of my friends earlier today. I just have the sense that these debates, though they're entertaining, never really end up changing anyone's mind. So, I mean, we were talking about vaccines. There was a recent call for Dr. I think his name is Peter Hotez to debate RFK on Joe Rogan's podcast about anti-vaccination campaigns, though it it didn't pan out. Maybe you saw this on Twitter, but I just wonder if it would have been successful in any sense. No, it's generally they're not. And, and I speak from experience. Years ago, I did a number of debates uh, as an evolutionary biologist with creationists. It never works. Uh, it's not, I mean, it's fun, you know, it, it can it can be fun, and but it it never actually works. As you say, you pretty much don't change people's minds. What you get mostly is partisans on one side or the other, uh, and it becomes you know, like a, a it's a sport. It, it's it's the equivalent to a, a sports spectator sports. That's that's what it is. And in fact, I would say it's counterproductive because you give a platform of uh, recognition to the other person. I think Joe Rogan is one of the major. Uh, sources of misinformation at this point uh, on the planet, and therefore he should be ignored. Uh, I know he's very popular, but you know the only thing to do is actually to ignore him. Uh, there is no, there, nothing comes out, nothing, nothing good come out, comes out of that kind of thing. RFK is the same thing, you just don't give him a platform. Now, the problem, of course, is that these people typically do have a platform of their own, and so they go on doing their thing. That cannot be helped. I mean, we're not, we're not going to get into you know, curtailing free speech unless it is in fact directly dangerous to people, in which case you can make an argument that that's that's harmful speech and therefore it can be curtailed, even even according to the Constitution. Uh, what we need is to, scientists to do their job, which usually does not involve communication to a public, the public. Most scientists are simply not trained to communicate to the public. It's a different set of skills. And you're, you know, most scientists are not good. If they are, by all means, they should do it. But, um, but most scientists are not. We do have a specialized class of people known as scientific journalists who do that. Though those are people that know enough of the science, and they also know enough about how to write or talk to the general public uh, that they can do it effectively. So education is the thing. And other than that, it's the way to go. And other than that. Uh, the media and the public itself had had to had to do their job of filtering things and ignoring uh, sources that are dangerous or nonsensical uh, to, from the get go. There, there is really no. I don't think there is much of a point in in getting into debates with these things. It's mud wrestling, and that that's that's what comes out of it. As an aside, I'm curious now: what are the elements of the skills and training that can make a scientist a good communicator to the public? Like, how does the information have to be 
repackaged to make it effective? Oh, uh, that is a very good question. And the best answer still, I think, was given by Aristotle 2,300 years ago. So you wrote a treatise on rhetoric. Um, and scientists need to, if they want to get into, into science communication, they need to learn rhetoric. Ethos, pathos, and... And, and, uh, um, e uh, e and logos. Ethos, pathos, and logos. So those, those three are the three aspects of persuasion, the three components of persuasion according to Aristotle. Logos is the only one that scientists actually manage. Logos means you, get your, you have to get your facts straight and your arguments sound. Because if you don't, then you're just bullshitting and, uh, or, or you're speaking out of ignorance and you shouldn't do it, right? And that's what scientists focus on because they've been trained to do that, to focus on the logos. The ethos has to do with character and credibility. You have to be credible and make a connection with your audience because otherwise they're not going to listen to you. And, and uh, credibility doesn't mean just putting PhD after your name or MD after your name. It means you have really have to connect to people. And most scientists are not capable of connecting with broader audiences. Again, they're not trained to do that. That's not their job, usually. While on the other hand, science communicators do that because that's what they're trained to do. And the one that really gets scientists upset and, and railed up is the um, pathos. Pathos means emotional. Yeah, you, you have to make an emotional connection with your audience. And this is often... Uh, put negatively in terms of, oh, I, you mean that I have to m manipulate my audience. It's not a question of manipulating. It's a question of making sure the audience understand why the hell they should make, they should care about what you're saying. You have to make a connection. So you use anecdotes, you use personal stories, things like that, because you want to make the connection. If you just present a bunch of graphs and, and, and spreadsheets, people are going to zoom out immediately. There's no, I'm going to fall asleep after the third slide with with a graph or, or, a, or a table on it it's just like not it's not engaging so unless if scientists want to do want to engage in that kind of uh, communication to the general public then they need to be aware of rhetorics they have to be aware of what they're doing and be trained in what they're doing and most of them are not which is why i'm very suspicious of scientists who turn science communicators yeah one problem for the scientist is that the pseudoscientist or conspiracy theory monger also has access to the logos, the ethos, and the pathos. Though maybe their maybe their logos isn't going to be as well informed. But you mentioned telling anecdote stories, these sorts of things. If somebody like RFK, who clearly has a great ability to develop uh, rapport with people through interviews, starts telling stories about people who are quote unquote vaccine injured that is immediately going to to uh, evoke sympathy from his target audience and Peter Hotez well I guess he can tell stories about how vaccines have saved people's lives but it's just a fundamental fact of psychology that we're extremely loss averse and if we hear one story about a child becoming autistic purportedly from a, a vaccine that's much more painful or damaging to us than is the story of a thousand children who are uplifted out of sickness from a vaccine. That's right. That's, that's correct. Now, however, the difference you just pointed out, that is RFK doesn't have the right logos, that's fundamental. That's important. That is why uh, you know he's wrong presumably i you know and and uh and scientists tend to be on the on the right side of things but yes of course everybody can use the other two components of aristotle's uh, rhetorical advice and that is why it's very difficult that's why it's it's a it's an art <clears throat> that requires serious application now look i think i won maybe a couple of debates in my career against creationists and in both cases was because i punched below the belt and I had, in fact, once I realized that, I had no compulsion whatsoever in doing it. What constitutes uh, punching below the belt against an anti or a creationist? Character assassination, for instance, which is one of the things that Aristotle says you should do. You should undermine the credibility of your opponent. In both cases, that's what I did. Uh, in one case, uh, Duane Gish <clears throat> was the my opponent. He's, he died a few years ago, but he was a, 
big deal in uh, the Institute for Creation Research. And he was doing lots of debates, like hundreds of debates a year. He was a professional debater. However, one day I caught him lying. He presented a slide with a quote from Stephen Jay Gould, the noted evolutionary biologist, and it looked like the slide was implying that Gould didn't believe in evolution, which I knew couldn't possibly be the case. <clears throat> now, I didn't know where the slide was coming from, so I made a, I just made a note, and I said, yeah, I'm going to look it up and see, see what happens. I did find the quote, but I also found that the quote ended with a comma after which Gould said, but of course, nobody in his right mind believes that kind of stuff, period. So it was obviously a manipulation of a quote out of context. And then, okay, fine. So I made a slide with the full quote from Gould, and I knew that I was going to run into Gish again, which I did a few months later. And he pulled up exactly the same slide because when you do hundreds of debates a year, you don't have time to update your stuff. You just, it, it, it becomes, you know, you, you always give the same spiel. Uh, and when he got to that point, I thought, ah, I got him. And sure enough, I showed the slide with the complete quote. He got really upset. Uh, he started saying things like, oh, I, I, I cannot possibly quote the entire book. I said, well, maybe not the entire book, but, you know, the entire sentence, perhaps. It's, you know, something that you could, you could manage. And afterwards, several of his supporters came to me to thank me, and they were uh, surprised and disappointed that uh, Gish had to, you know, rely with, with that kind, on that kind of trick uh, in order to make his point. So there I made a dent. Um, and it was because I, sh I basically went not after the facts, but af after scientific facts, I went after the character of the person that was on the other side of the debate. The second case uh, was very similar. Jonathan Wells, uh, who was a leading member of the Discovery Institute in Seattle. It's a, it's a think tank that is devoted to intelligent design. And he has this story that he tells people uh, about, you know, Oh, he was uh, was really not not that interested in biology, but he finally there was something that that didn't quite feel right. So he went back to school and he got a PhD in, in molecular biology with the express purpose of figuring out things. And then he discovered that everything was a lie, etc. Cetera, et cetera. And it's a nice story, but it's not true. the The story when I did some research turns out that he was told to get a PhD in molecular biology for the precise purpose of undermining evolutionary uh, arguments, and he was told to do so by the Reverend Moon. And when I pointed that out in an audience full of Southern Baptists, I literally heard a gasp in the audience because Southern Baptists, as it turned out, don't like Moonists. They just hate each other. And so once they discovered that this speaker not only had lied to them, but in fact had omitted a fundamental uh, aspect of his uh, CV, they, then he lost the audience. Now, was that fair? Yep. <laughs> because you're li if you're lying to your audience, uh, it is fair game for, for your opponent to point that out, to undermine your ethos. That's, that's, what we're, that's where Aristotle was right. But most scientists wouldn't do that. They would, you know, go high and go above, uh, above the fray and just you know, stay on the high road and all that sort of stuff. And I say, bullshit. This is not, it's not going to work. Uh, if you really decide to do that, my first advice, piece of advice would be don't do it. But if you want to do it, then you have to play using all three of the areas of rhetoric allowed by Aristotle, not just the logos. Mm. Your story about the the gold quote really illuminates something, I think, about the psychology of debates and persuasion in that the facts, the science are much more abstract and difficult to appraise, whereas we judge someone's character so viscerally. And whether it's rational or not, if we come to dislike or distrust someone, we then just immediately discount everything that they say. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, is that rational? No, but it's human. And since we're talking, we're not talking about debating perfectly rational people. We're talking about or entities. We're talking about debating uh, human beings, and we're talking about an audience of human beings, not an audience of, you know, logical algorithms. So you have to take that into account. If you don't, uh, then you're undermining your own position, and you're doing a lot more damage than than good. <laughs> 
Hmm. Now, as a, a final question, I wanted to ask you something ab about something that I really knew nothing about before looking at nonsense on stilts, but I'm fairly new to the whole public facing side of academia. And you wrote about the decline of the public intellectual and the rise of the think tank. And this isn't something that I've ever noticed or thought about, especially since I listen to so many podcasts put out by individuals. But what is the general concern here regarding the decline of intellectuals on the one hand, and then the rise of think tanks? So those are two different concerns, but they are related uh, because th the combination of, in my mind at least, the combination of decline of intellectualism, public intellectualism, and uh, and the rise of think tanks have actually lowered the public discourse. To which, of course, a major third component this needs to be added, and that's the rise of social media. But let's set set that aside for a, for a, for a moment, right? So what do I mean by public intellectuals? Well, you know, people like Noam Chomsky, for instance, right? So this is somebody who is a serious intellectual, a serious academic who has done research in, in you know, certain areas that has been published, etc. And then he decides that he has a duty to participate in public political social discourse from his point of view, bringing in his expertise as a public intellectual. One of the problems with a good number of podcasters or scientists who get into podcasting is that they start talking about everything, including a lot of things that they really have no expertise on. I'm a great I mean, example. I've heard, well, <laughs> but you see, you talk to other people. So you call somebody who is, a, that's a different issue. That's, that's, a, that's having a conversation where you play the part of the more or less well-informed layperson and who says, okay, I got this guy or this person and I want to talk to you about, about this topic. That's a whole different thing. But there are, you know, I've heard physicists talking about philosophy without knowing anything about philosophy. I, I, I've heard, uh, you know, his, economists talking about history without knowing about history. So it's like, that is something that Chomsky would never do. That is something that the old guard in the, uh, public intellectuals will never do. Uh, Chomsky's point is that, and then go, of course, this goes regardless of whether you agree or disagree with Chomsky's specific political ideas. I happen to agree with a number of them and disagree with others. So it's not like I think that Chomsky is the, you know, is the last word on everything. But what you will notice if you look at his public appearances is that he talks always about the same things because those are the things that he's done research on. Those are the things that he feels confident He's not, he's not a general generalized talker about everything. And one of the things that we've seen now is this ability, because of new media, of people to just get in front of an audience and start talking about all sorts of stuff of which they presumably don't know much. The related issue there is the rise of think tanks. So think tanks started out in the early part of the 20th century as universities without students. That was the definition, um, one of the famous definitions of a think tank. In other words, these were bodies that were supposed to do research and advise the government uh, or the public in general about certain certain issues that were at the borderline, at the interface between basic research and application and applied uh, policy uh, kind of things. But then the concept evolved over the decades uh, to the point now that anybody who has a little bit of money can set up a think tank and then send out these white papers or these these uh, declarations to government officials, to the media, etc., um, that are clearly partisan. I mean, a lot of the, not all, but a lot of the, the, the think tanks that we have these days uh, currently active are clearly blatantly part partisan. And so when, and they've made inroads not only in government, you know, by pretending to be research. You know, the, the whole point about doing research in an academic setting is that you're supposed to be doing it from a neutral perspective, politically speaking. Now, of course, that's an ideal. No, nobody is completely neutral on anything, right? But it, there is a difference between being human and therefore ha having opinions on the one hand and being blatantly and overtly 
partisan on the other hand, having an obvious partisan agenda on the other hand. And so these days, like, you know, when I listen to national public radio and they introduce, oh, so-and-so from the Heritage Foundation, I turn it off. I'm not interested in what the Heritage Foundation want, uh, says because I know exactly what it what they're going to say because they always say the same things. Uh, it is always from the from point of view of you know conservative libertarian perspective. Same goes for other for liberal foundations that there is the equivalent on the other side. I'm just not interested. I want to know the facts. I want to know the research. Talk to somebody who has actually done research, independent research. Uh, you know, usually at a university, but not necessarily. And I want to know the opinions of m- multiple experts who have actually worked on that thing. And then I want to know what policymakers think of making out of those facts and, 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 and scientific opinions. I'm just not interested in essentially uh, partisan spinning of, 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 those, of those issues. It's just not, it's not helping public discourse, but unfortunately, it's happening more and more. Well, Matthew, this has been such a pleasure. I know that another of your great interests is ancient philosophy and its applications today as evidenced by the many times in which it came up. So maybe at some point in the future, we'll be able to delve into those topics. But for now, this was such a wonderful conversation. Thanks for joining me. It has been a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Hold on, Geeslings. Before you go, please uh, like, subscribe, follow if you haven't already smash all those buttons and also if you haven't followed me on uh twitter at robinson Earhart, or if you're not joining me every morning as i eat my pint of ice cream on twitch at robinson Earhart on robinson eats please do so